Hi, good evening to everyone. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and I am here to give you the latest update from the CDC with regards to the COVID booster shots for the fall coming into the winter season. There are just a few points that I'd like to highlight. The first, as I said, is the updated recommendations, and this was from the September 12th. I'll also be going back to a previous paper on underlying medical conditions and severe illness, again published from the CDC. And this is really to try and show you that we are dealing with what appears to be a different kind of COVID-19. Before I start that, I'd like to remind anyone who is interested that we have courses available at MR Education. There is a link below, multiple courses, free and otherwise, that we'd be very happy for you to support us with, as well as links to our upcoming conferences. So getting back to the main point, I think we have to ask an important question. And as I said before, this is part of a standard SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. We are coming into a period of time where cases are rising again from the Omicron variant 2.86. And the question we have to ask is what would occur or what is the contingency plan if delivering COVID boosters fails? What I mean by fails is you have to acknowledge, and it's very important for some of the listeners, it's very important to be balanced in how you think about this. The COVID booster is still being used primarily because it does have a short to medium term impact on reducing severe COVID-19. And that's why it has been given probably about four or five times already, because it did have an impact. The question is, how long and what do we do if that impact, even in the short or medium term, disappears? That's where we are heading at the moment. So let's look carefully at what the latest recommendations from the CDC are. So this was on the 12th of September, 2023. And they are recommending that COVID vaccines are given for everyone six months and older. And it will be available by the end of this week in most places that you would get your vaccines. They're specifically asking for older people and persons with weakened immune systems who are at greater risk, greatest risk of hospitalization and death. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. Um, and as they said, the updated vaccine should work well against currently circulating COVID-19 variants, including BA 2.86. The benefits of the COVID-19 vaccination continue to outweigh any potential risks. And serious reactions after COVID vaccination is rare. So that's the perspective of the CDC, and they're encouraging everyone over six months old in the US to go forward and get their booster. And as I said before, it's important to acknowledge that the booster vaccine did have or does have an impact on the severity of the disease. Here is where I think I want to focus. And this bit I think is extremely important because we're almost starting to see an evolution of what is happening with regards to the, well, the pandemic is over, or what I would call an epidemic in highly vaccinated regions. The reason I say an epidemic in highly vaccinated regions is because I spent the time reflecting on one of the places in the world that doesn't like vaccines, that's Papua New Guinea. They only had 4.15% uptake. And Papua New Guinea at the moment, I checked just a few minutes before this, I looked to see what exactly are the headlines on COVID-19 in Papua New Guinea. They are looking at, in March, they were looking at a roving task force for immunization gaps. They were talking about COVID vaccine hesitancy, 
Um, the fact that people were losing faith in childhood vaccines during COVID. This was in April 2023. The reality is that there are no new stories in Papua New Guinea that is highlighting that they are facing a problem with this new variant. It's important to acknowledge that because if they are not having a problem and they are not vaccinated, what would be the reason for that? And it's simply down to natural mucosal immunity. Quite likely that almost all the population has been exposed. They therefore have herd immunity and therefore they don't have ongoing spread in any significant way of the Omicron virus. On the other hand, in highly vaccinated regions, all the evidence is coming out that there is a problem at population level to control the neutralization of the virus. And even though people are not getting as sick, they are still circulating it. That's a problem. Now, here is the CDC's image with regards to what is currently happening between March 2020 and August 26, 2023. And you can see in this image here that the purple line is the over 75s who've always been most severely affected. And you can see down at the bottom here, the yellow line is the 12 to 17 year olds. But as we come to, um, into, to August 2023, we can see that there is an uptick in terms of infection rates. And this uptick is occurring even when they are not trying very hard to look for infection rates. And so this is extremely important because it is likely to be a significant underestimation as to how severe or how many cases are currently occurring in the United States based on the CDC figures. And this is likely to be the same across many parts of the highly vaccinated parts of the world, because it's now an epidemic. It's no longer a pandemic, because as we said, Africa, Papua New Guinea, places that were struggling initially to get vaccines now seem to no longer have a problem with regards to the pandemic. Our leaders need to explain why that is occurring and what is the scientific explanation if they disagree with my perspective. Here is what I find most concerning, and this is again taking it from the CDC data. This is the proportion of underlying conditions among COVID-19 associated deaths by age. And in this picture here, they are looking at the age group 18 to 49 years old. And they found that 45% of the deaths of COVID patients here were lowest of no conditions here, and this is in the age groups, 18 to 49, 50 to 64, 65 plus. And we can see that the highest affected group is the immunocompromised here. No conditions. What's remarkable is that in no conditions, the highest affected is the 18 to 49 cohort. The reason I'm highlighting this is because I want to show you the evolution of what has happened with regards to the data. And so I go back to the paper that was published just in 2021 after the first year of the pandemic. And at that point, that was when we had the problem with the, the alpha. Uh, we didn't have delta just yet because this paper was looking at March to March 20 and uh, March 2020 to March 2021. This was looking at underlying medical conditions and severe illnesses among 540,000 adults hospitalized with COVID-19. And so this data was collected directly in relation to the NIH and the CDC. So this is an important piece of information. And they were looking at 800 US hospitals in the premier health care database. And they were looking, and at that time, among almost 5 million hospitalized adults, they were looking that the most common, or they said here actually, COVID-19, 94.9 .9 had at least one underlying medical condition. And this is why I had said originally targeted vaccination would have been the most logical thing at that time, because that's 95% of your pop of the affected population, you know, has at least one condition. 
essential hypertension was the highest. That's remarkable with obesity being 33% being most common. So this was what was occurring in the context of prior to us bringing in the vaccination program. Now, this is the bit here that I think is really critical and why I'm concerned going into the future. When it comes to looking at what happened and the characteristics of patients who were affected, and I've got it here, I'll make this full screen. This is the characteristics of the hospitalized patients with COVID-19. And I want you to look very closely at this. This is talking about the number of conditions that they've had. Greater than one here, zero, one, two to five, six to 10, greater than 10. I've also broken it down by sex, male or female. But the one that I want you to concentrate on is number of conditions, zero. That means that the individuals affected had no medical problems. Of that, they had 9.4% of the total cohort who were admitted with COVID-19. Of that number, they had 27,000 that were relatively uh, the full sample of hospitalized with COVID-19, that's 5.1%. And when you look at the numbers who died, it was 740 or 0.09% across all age groups. Okay, so this is not the young patients. This is across all age groups. 0.9% had no medical conditions and were affected severely with regards to COVID-19. And there's another point about this that I'll do before we go back to the issue of what is happening now, is when you look at the paper again, it shows you another very interesting statistic. They broke it down by the conditions, the underlying medical conditions that were most significantly associated with severe outcomes. Again, I said hypertension right at the top, lipid meta disorders of lipid meta uh, metabolism and obesity. These are the top three. When you go down the line here, there is absolutely no mention of the immunocompromised. None at all. All of the diseases here, none of them are related to people who are immune compromised. And when you think back clinically to what occurred in the pandemic, it was quite remarkable that younger people with no comorbidities who were immunocompromised and on, in, and on medication, which suppressed the immune system, did not seem to be at significantly higher risk of severe disease and death. And that's borne out with the statistics. Here we have a problem now, because as I said before, when you look at the CDC numbers here, the immune compromise now are at the highest risk. Why have we had a shift in the context of the type of patients who are most severely affected at this point? Even no conditions is far more significantly affected than the 0.9% that occurred in the first phase of the pandemic. I'm not allowed to necessarily say what I think would be the cause of that, but our scientific leaders need to explain it. Because we're at a point now in the pandemic, as we go into the winter in the Northern Hemisphere, that if we don't have a strategy outside of what has been repeatedly done for the past three years that has delayed, kicked the can down the road, there is a very serious problem ahead of us. It is incumbent on our scientific leaders to make sure that there are contingency plans in place. It shouldn't just be about the booster at this point. There should be a plan B or a plan C or a plan D. And if you did have that, why would you not implement it immediately? Why would you wait? Why would you use the booster as your only or your primary modality when we know that there is going to be a limited or likely to be a limited impact going through the winter period? There are some tough questions ahead, and I'm not trying to make it easy for the scientific community. 
It is a responsibility, especially in times where we've had significant censorship of opposing scientific views. You're not in a position where you're allowed to make mistakes. We have to have very clear answers. What are the contingency plans if your current strategy does not deliver the outcomes that you hope? That's what I mean when, we, when I say, suppose the COVID booster fails. What do we do next? So the lesson that we have learned so far is that some parts of the world, Papua New Guinea, seem to be fine. Certain parts of Africa seem to be fine. But certainly in the first world, there is a problem. And there needs to be an acknowledgement as to why. And critically, what do we do to get ourselves out of it? Have a great evening.